So there's a lot of uh, a lot of work that has to be done, and we have to we have to all the time be thinking what are the measures of measures of equity in what we talk about by way of carbon emissions per capita, distributional issues, developmental issues. Have we all forgotten the Millennium Goals? How do we achieve those things at the same time we're working towards a more equitable distribution of how carbon is is emitted around the world? Clarity on financing. I think you're going to see a lot of horse trading in Copenhagen on how much money we are prepared to put, how much money are you prepared to put. Let's see whether I can one-up you on how much money I'm prepared to spend. So the European community is already talking about $100 billion in financing for uh, technology deployment and, uh, and transfer. Well, I think we need to think seriously about how this is all going to happen. How much can government budgets really take on? Two, three hundred billion dollars a year. I wonder about that. Is it going to be by assessment? Do we really expect the U.S. Congress to agree to an assess of contribution of a hundred and some odd billion dollars uh, a year for transfer of technology and transfer of technology? Whose technology? People own technologies. So how do we uh, begin to get at this seriously? If it's going to take $22 billion to put in the infrastructure we need to have the energy we need in 2030 and another 10 trillion, 22 trillion and 10 trillion. Half of that's going to have to go into the emerging economies, developing countries, however you want to characterize them, where the markets are not mature, where the independent investor, the foreign direct investor is not likely to go in, he doesn't have a rate base in the power sector, he doesn't have a guaranteed fuel supply in the power sector, what would cause him to go in and invest those monies and what do governments need to do to precipitate that? You have to have a major market reform component of this process if you really expect those monies to transfer. And you're going to have to have more than government budgets to do it. The private sector is going to have to be motivated, or this is just not going to happen. Institutions and subsidiarity. Uh, we, we do climate change negotiations the way the United States does energy bills. You don't even bother with the principles. You just hang all the baubles on the trees. You put this benefit, that pork barrel, this other event. All of that's stuck to the, uh, stuck to the energy bill. So you end up at the end of the day with virtually nothing because you can't pass it, because there's no way to allocate out all the pork. And so here we are in Copenhagen negotiating amongst 181 countries a climate change issue that has got all kinds of social, welfare, economic, commercial implications. Don't we need to break this thing down into man manageable bites? Now we hear talk about the, the G2. It's not a G2, it's, it's China and, and US looking for some common ground, looking for some ways to define this issue. Let's trade, for example, carbon intensity for targetry. You, Uncle Sam, you pick a target, and I will give you some commitments on carbon intensity, not energy intensity, but carbon intensity of the Chinese economy, maybe. Maybe something else. And then they take that to the G20. Maybe they take it through the G8 to the G20, or to the MEF, the G8, uh, the G20 has a better composition in some sense in terms of the distribution of representation. The MEF has the advantage of all of the emissions. It's got 85% of the emissions. And then take those consensus building tools up into, the, up into the UNFCCC. Now that makes a fair amount of sense. You build from the bottom up. You can't negotiate a deal amongst 181 countries. If you've ever been to a COP, uh, there are thousands of people rushing around, NGOs, journalists, government officials, everybody's there. And how do you negotiate something in that context? Use the, use the organizations that are suited for this kind of work. Use the IMF for financial issues. Use the World Bank for development issues. Use the IEA for measurement, policy, benchmarking. We've got a lot of mechanisms to build before we can begin to trade and understand what it is we're trading. What's the value of a ton of carbon? Well, who's ton of carbon? And where is that ton of carbon? And how can you demonstrate that that ton of carbon has been saved anyway? What are your measurement techniques? We don't have the databases. We don't have a lot of things. Let's start breaking this thing down into manageable units where we can actually get something done. We're going to have to work on trajectories. Do we all have to end up at the same point? We all said we were going to end up at a ton and a half in 2050. Well, maybe some people end up at, at higher levels and some people at lower levels. The Indians have done some projections on their scenarios forward. Actually, their emissions never achieve more than uh, six or eight tons per person in the course of the time, but that may mean that you have to overshoot and work your way back down to 2050. But well, we're going to have to get practical now. We've been engaged in the politics and the rhetoric since 1988. It's 2009. Time to get to work. We have some new heads of government, some new governments shaping. The German government will approach these things differently. The U.S. government will. The Japanese government already is. Uh, this is an opportunity for us to make a difference, if not in Copenhagen, then draw some lines, set some principles, 
identify some ways forward and keep on it 2010, 2011, whatever it takes. Thank you.